Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their financial support helps cover the costs associated with hosting and producing the Backyard Ecology podcast and blog. If you would like to join them, you can find out more information on the Backyard Ecology website or by searching for Backyard Ecology on the Patreon website. Today we're going to be talking all about the spotted lanternfly, which is sometimes referred to by the initials SLF. And the format for today's episode is going to be a little different than normal because I don't just have one guest, I have four. Those guests are Aaron Otto, who is the National Policy Manager for the Spotted Lanternfly and is with the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS. Dana Rhodes, who is the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's State Plant Regulatory Official. Suba Reddy Polly, who is Kentucky State Entomologist and a Department Chair at the University of Kentucky. And Tracy Lesky, who is a research entomologist and director at the USDA's Appalachian Fruit Research Station. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Thank you. So I'm looking forward to this because the spotted lanternfly, for those that don't know, is an invasive insect that was first detected in Pennsylvania and has been spreading throughout the country, especially the eastern part of the country, since then. And there's been a lot of effort put towards really getting the word out about the spotted lanternfly, not just within the states where it's currently found, but also in other states as well. So given that this is an issue that is either affecting many of us who are listening to this podcast or has the potential to affect many of us, I thought it would be a good idea to have an episode that's talking about the spotted lanternfly. But it's kind of also a complex conversation because we do have spotted lanternflies in some states, but not in others. So the states are dealing with it differently in that manner. You've got the national overview of trying to figure out how to manage it or deal with it. And then there's all the research going on because it's been around long enough now that some things we know, some things we don't know. We're discovering things that we don't know and starting to learn some of that stuff as well. So there's all these different angles to look at. And instead of just picking one and having one person talk about one thing, I thought it'd be really fun to have multiple people who could talk about all these different angles and give us the different insights. So Aaron will be helping us understand kind of overarching work and coordination going on at a national level. And then at a state level, Pennsylvania has been fighting the spotted land and fly for the longest. So Dana brings with her that been there, done that wisdom, experiences, and lessons learned of a state that has been dealing with spotted lantern flies for several years now. And then Kentucky, where I'm at, we don't have it yet. But four out of the seven states that surround us do. So it's a pretty good chance it's coming. And in the not too distant future, probably. So I've asked Reddy to represent those states like Kentucky that are on the leading edge, but don't have it yet and would like to keep it that way for as long as possible. And then behind the scenes with any emerging threat, there's all the research scientists, and they're doing the really important work of trying to help us better understand the threat, come up with ways to stop it, or at least manage it the best we can. So Tracy will be representing the researchers and will be sharing with us some of what's going on from that angle as well. So like I said, it's going to be a very educational episode for myself as well. And I'm really looking forward to learning a lot about spotted lanternflies because I know what I've seen on the internet and what I've read, but I don't have any personal experience with them. I'd rather not have any anytime soon too, but it's still good to be aware and to know. So let's just start at the very beginning and learn a little bit about the spotted lanternfly. Now, it's from China, correct? Is where it's native to? That is yes. correct, Shannon. Okay. Do we know how it got here? Um, well, I can talk a little bit about that. It first showed up in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. We believe that it may have come in as egg masses on stone that was imported maybe from China, but it then, you know, the eggs hatched and we started to get a population. 
So uh, that's where we, we won't ever know for absolute sure, but that's the suspected pathway that it got in. Yeah. It's always hard to know for sure, but and yeah. I was like, do we? Because I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> and usually the answer is no, but we've got a pretty good suspect. We think. Yeah. 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 Okay. And even though it's called the spotted lantern fly, it's not a fly. It's a type of plant hopper and plant hoppers are really, really kind of cool critters. We've got several native ones here in North America and in the Eastern US and they're little green, they're little insects, often kind of green, like stem colored insects. And they often have their wings, they'll hold them in kind of a, looks like an A-frame tent type way. I do a lot of camping and stuff and grew up camping, so it's a tent. And they're really kind of fun. I think most of us that do gardening have probably seen them because you'll see these little insects. They're not itty bitty, but they're not big by any means on stems. And if you kind of look at them, a lot of times they kind of shift over to the other side of the stem and kind of try and keep hidden from you. And they really blend in pretty well. So you have to be looking for them, but you do see them if you start looking at the stems of plants. But just because we have native plant hoppers doesn't mean that this one just kind of naturally falls in the ecosystem. It, it's doing some pretty massive damage, but like other plant hoppers, it does feed on sap, correct? Yeah. And I can answer a little bit more about the insects. So it is a plant hopper. It's in the family Fulgoridae. And that's, you know, and it's just in the same order as Hemiptera. So if you think about insects like cicadas and scale insects and true bugs, like a box elder bug, those are all in the same order. And then the, this little hopper fits in the Fulgorid family within that order. This little bugger is interesting and in there's not a lot of pests in the world that are this family. So this is an unusual member of its own family. And it is, it's a gorgeous insect. It's black and red and as an adult, and you're right, it does hold its wings as a tent instead of flat on its back, like a box elder bug, you know, box elder bugs are also red and black. So that's one good way to tell them apart. And there's a lot of red and black insects in your backyard. You know, if you think about it, there's, there's ladybugs and then there's maybe you have milkweed and you have the milkweed uh, longhorn beetle, that serambicid beetle. Um, so you can tell the spotted lanternfly apart from those beetles in that the spotted lanternfly has those flexible membranous wings, not that hard shell, that elytra, like you have on those beetles. Once you see it and you sort of look at it, you can tell it apart easily from other insects. And then the nymphs, the young ones, the pictures that I was looking at almost reminded me, I don't know, vaguely of somewhere like the wheel bug nymphs yeah. or the assassin bug nymphs for some reason. Yeah. So maybe if you're in an area with spot and lancer fly in April, maybe May, you'll start noticing the first instars, the little guys that hatch first out of the eggs and they're black and white. And to me, the, their abdomen kind of looks like a, like a crumpled sack, you know, it, <laughs> or maybe an accordion. It's just this crumpled little, you know, back end on this cute little body with a, a little beak that they're going to use to feed off the sap. And then as the season progresses, they go through a couple of instars. And then that last instar, that fourth instar, uh, it changes color. It's now black with red spots. And each time it gets bigger. And then in July, around July, you'll start seeing the adults emerge. And it's not uncommon to see in your backyard at one time, maybe a third instar nymph that's black with white spots, a fourth instar nymph, which is black with red spots, and then an adult at the same time. There's a bit of overlap with the instar, so it's not a nice clean break. Okay. Another thing to note about the nymphs, if you're observing them, they are great at jumping. So if you are watching them, uh, you need to make sure that you're looking at yourself before you start moving around because they will land on you and they go wherever you go and even the adults. So that's why we are always saying, look before you leave. And I'll just add to what Dana is saying as a researcher, we work with these insects in quarantine zones. And so we want to make sure we don't take them with us and we heed Dana's advice. So we use leaf blowers to blow off our vehicle several times before we leave any quarantine zone. And as Dana said, we kind of are uh, 
you know, we are very acceptable as a visual stimulus to these guys. We're dark and upright from their perspective. So we look like kind of like a tree trunk. So they will hop on us and they will happily go with us unless we deter them. (laughs) Very good to know, especially coming from somebody who, like I said, I'm not having to deal with it yet. So I'm just, I'm learning. So you were talking about the different end stars and then we have the adults When do they lay the eggs and what happens with the eggs? The eggs come later. So around September is when uh, we will start to see a few egg masses laid. And when they're laid, they're very shiny. And they put about 35 to 50 eggs in one egg mass. The females lay them in very straight lines. And then they put a covering over them. It's a protective covering, kind of a waxy covering. And the interesting thing with that egg mass is it blends in very well with the trees because it's very grayish. And as it ages, it actually starts darkening and blends perfectly in on whatever it's laid on. And it becomes almost cracked like, so it looks like a smear of mud. So that's why if you've never seen an egg mass, they're very hard to detect at first. But once you identify one or two, your eye will naturally uh, start picking them up. And sometimes they are clumped very closely together. We see a pattern where egg masses were laid the previous year. We tend to see more egg masses laid the next year. So I know the researchers are working to try and figure out why are they doing this? Is it a behavior? Is it, you know, a scent? What what exactly draws them back to an area where they've been to before? But the egg masses will winter over very easily. I know people are thinking, oh, well, we've had a really nice hard freeze this winter. It's been colder than usual in January. So, you know, that should take care of spotted lanternfly. Well, the researchers I've talked to say it will take negative 10 to negative 15 degrees, 30 consecutive days before it would kill egg masses. And I don't think any of us want to go through that kind of low temperature for 30 days. So they will survive our winters. And the other piece I would just add regarding the egg masses, as Dana said, they're very cryptic and they, you know, look like a smear of mud. Unfortunately, sometimes the females will really lay them in very much concealed locations. For example, on dead standing trees, we find large numbers under the bark, you know, and things like dead ash trees where you have this invasional meltdown where the emerald ash borer has killed the tree. And then the lanternfly uses it as a location to deposit lots of egg masses. So sometimes they're just not obvious, but they are there in big numbers too. That, that's, that's scary thinking about like down here, we've got a lot of shagbark hickory trees or white oaks and stuff like that. So you've got the plating of the bark, even on live trees. And then, like you said, once you start getting into the dead trees, that just brings in a whole lot of other places that they can actually hide in and issues there. And they will also lay their eggs on other things just besides trees. We have seen them on the undersides of picnic tables or benches that sit outside. On the coverings that you put on your furniture during the winter, people will take them off and they have laid egg masses underneath because it's very protected where those are. Rusty metal, again, seems to be a draw, stone. We just see egg masses laid on many, many different things, vehicles, So again, that's why we're always diligent in telling people, you know, if you've been to an area and we know egg mass season is happening, please make sure that you're checking, wash your vehicles, get all that mud off of your vehicles before you're moving. And what kind of plants are we finding them on? What kind of plants are they feeding on? When the nymphs hatch, they're very hungry. So they are looking for soft plant material that they can easily tap into and just, you know, feed just about on anything. And they're kind of like kids where they want to try everything. So they'll put lots of different things in their mouth, seeing if it tastes good. So especially when they're hatching in April or May, that's about the time we're planting our gardens outside. So if they're close to a vegetable garden, they're going to go on different plants that are in your vegetable garden. I know we've seen them on cucumbers. We've seen them on pepper plants. So lots of different things. But we do know that there are moments in their life where they are drawn to Atlantis or tree of heaven. And that's a native tree for them, but it's an invasive tree for North America. 
that they are drawn to that. And I'm really thankful for all the research that is going on trying to narrow the host list or to try and determine, you know, how truly successful they can be if Tree of Heaven is not available to them. What does that look like? But the most devastation we have seen has been on grapevines. They are especially drawn to them as adults, and we have seen great uh, numbers of losses in vines and vineyards uh, from the feeding damage of spotted lanternfly. And I guess I'll add, and from the perspective of agriculture, as Dana indicated, grape and specifically Vitis vinifera, the wine grapes, have been most heavily affected particularly from the adults feeding in the late season, where if you see a high density of adults feeding on your grapevines in the late season, the next year, you're probably going to have less fruit to harvest. It seems to really interfere with photosynthetic potential and vigor in the vines. And so the research that we've been doing has been trying to, as Dana said, narrow that host range. And so one of the interesting things we found this past year is that while Vitis vinifera, the wine grapes are very good as a developmental host, meaning that if nymphs feed on them, they can make it to the adult stage and do reasonably well, particularly when they have a second host associated with them, whether it be tree of heaven, an apple tree, or black walnut. But Rotundifolia, the muscadine grapes, are mus you know, our native species are not as good. They do not do as well on muscadine grapes. So that's kind of interesting. Unfortunate for our vineyards, but interesting. And so the next question really is, well, how are they going to do on all of these different species of grapes, whether it's the, you know, the juice grapes or wine grapes or some of our native species. But that's why we're concerned because, you know, we have seen impacts in wine grapes in particular, as Dana said, in her state in PA, we're just starting to see it in our area in Northern Virginia, where they're starting to invade vineyards. And so it's a big deal for those vineyard operators. Oh yeah, I'm sure. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask was if it's in the vineyard grapes, what does it do for our native grapes? But it sounds like at least some of them, they're not They'll use them, but not as attracted to, and others we just don't know yet. We do see them feeding on wild grapevines in nature very, you know, I would say all the time, but um, the nymphs are able to easily move by walking or jumping, and so they can mix their diet among a couple of different hosts pretty easily. Tree of Heaven, as Dana has indicated, it's an invasive, so pretty prevalent, and then you know, as adults, they can fly so they can go where they want to go and find what they need. So that's the issue is that they are moving from this, you know, wild host habitat into agricultural production. And that's becoming an economic issue for growers. And we've mentioned tree of heaven. And that's one of the reasons I'm really, really, really not looking forward to it coming to Kentucky, because on my property, tree of heaven and microstigium or Japanese stiltgrass are our two biggest plant invasive species that we're fighting. And I doubt I ever get rid of Tree of Heaven. One, it's Tree of Heaven. And two, just down the road, there's a couple of nice specimen trees in somebody's yard. So we've got a major seed bank that just is going to keep coming in to our property, unfortunately. So yeah, I'm not looking forward to it getting to Kentucky because I know they're going to love my property, unfortunately. But they'll also feed on our native plants too. I mean, walnuts, several of our maple trees, like you said, some of our native grapes as well, and to the garden species, but it's not just an agricultural problem. We've got potential ecological issues here with them getting into our native plants as well. You are correct. This is definitely going to be a pest that is not just straight up agricultural focus. This is going to be an urban to suburban to agricultural to uh, forest and land pests. As you were saying about Tree of Heaven, Tree of Heaven, uh, we actually brought it to America. It it got to America in the the 1700s. And there's actually some original specimen trees that are historic in Philadelphia that are Tree of Heaven. And if you've ever read the book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, that tree is Alanthus. So it's been here a long time. And as you said, the seed bank is enormous. It's very opportunistic. Anytime you have disturbed ground, if there's a seed there, it's going to grow. And even if you try to cut it back, 
if you don't use some sort of treatment, you run the risk of getting more saplings because it, it does grow by coppice. So you, you cut one stem, you're going to get three or four stems out of that one stem anywhere that's disturbed. So it is literally all over the U.S. It, it just is, it's kind of everywhere it, and you don't really notice it, but it's there. Aaron, and so what kind of calls did you get from urban areas? Where were you getting them this year? Like sort of the spread, like I know Philly was on the hot, in the hot area and yeah. Philly, um, uh, Staten Island, mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the boroughs in, in New York City. And so in that case, it's not necessarily an agricultural pest, but it's a nuisance pest, right? You don't want to eat in your backyard in Wilmington, Delaware, if you have, you know, hundreds of spotter and lantern flies hopping around your barbecue and then trying to climb you and jump into the air. So, <laughs> you know, in that case, it's gotten the attention of, you know, some suburban and urban folks because they're just not really used to this. And it's because tree of heaven is so absolutely prevalent in these areas. It's just insidious. It grows uh, it's just so opportunistic. It just grows everywhere. Anywhere there's a crack in the sidewalk, it really can grow. And thousands per square mile. The other thing to note too is the insect itself doesn't have very strong jaw muscles. So it's when it taps in, it's reliant on the plant to actually push liquid into the insect. They do not suck. They just wait for the plant to feed them. Um, so that's why you will see some of the movement that is going on, because the later you go into the season, the trees start to senesce. They start to go to sleep for the winter time. And as that happens, the insects are then looking for the next type of tree that can feed it better than the one it's leaving. That's why, and Tracy, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's why they kind of end up on maple at the end of the year, because that's the last tree to shut down. Yeah. And we see a pretty strong movement in the fall from Tree of Heaven, which is one of their favorite hosts on Maple, because it's still got the goods, you know, to continue to feed. And in fact, they'll die in place in the fall, just feeding yes. on the tree. You know, when we have a, a big freeze, they just they are there and you can find them the next field season. Even they're still dead on the tree. <laughs> yeah. We used to get calls in the wintertime with people saying, oh, I found a whole population of spotted lanternfly flying around. Um, and we're like, well, that's not the right season. So we would go and check it out. And sure enough, it would be adults that had frozen in place on trees that were being blown around by the wind. And people thought they were alive and flying. So yes, it's amazing. Wow. Okay, that brings up a question then. Well, before we ask, uh, ask that question, we're recording this in February of 2022. As of right now, how many states do we know currently have spotted lantern flies? So currently we have 11 states with populations of spotted lantern fly. Um, so it's the mid-Atlantic, some are going up into the Northeast, and we have a couple Midwestern states. So if you want the list, it's Connecticut and Delaware, Indiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. Okay. So it's sort of growing out a little bit from that mid-Atlantic region. And that kind of helps also paint the picture and get to what I was about to ask, because it seems like it's a lot of these more northern states right now. I mean, not far north, but more, more northern than more southern, we'll put it that way. Um, do we expect it to kind of continue to spread everywhere? Or are there some of these natural constraints like climate or habitat? And I'm thinking if the freezes are what's killing the adults and it can spread south, I mean, Kentucky, how long do you have to have for a freeze? Because we don't have a lot of that super cold temperature. And then you start going even further south and it gets even warmer. Shannon, that's a great concern. In Pennsylvania, it takes a couple of hard frosts before the adults are dead. But keep in mind, again, they're dependent on trees being able to push sap through them to feed. So if they do not have a source of food because the trees have shut down and they really are not prone to go to evergreens. So they really like deciduous trees more. So that is going to impact 
how long they can survive in an area because they have to feed. They cannot go very long without feeding. So that is a good thing. So as the trees shut down, we see significant slowdowns the farther into fall that we get. So we know the end is coming. So we're not going to have a continuously breeding population probably setting up. Well, until they get to the south, unfortunately, we won't know that. And that's an active area of research as well, Shannon, where we're trying to understand what constraints may be on the egg masses as well for overwintering, as well as just like you were describing some of the ecological constraints with hosts and maybe day length and temperature. All of those things can affect whether an insect can establish. I kind of figured it was still the ongoing research, but I was hoping we had it. Oh, no, they'll die off. They can't go beyond here and here because of that. No. (laughs) It's still research going on. Yeah. Yes. We all wish that. Yeah. (laughs) But the other thing too, is there may be indications that it gets too hot in some areas for them to survive. So that's another, I mean, there's so many questions and thank goodness we have researchers like Tracy who are out there trying to find all the answers because the more we learn, you were so spot on in your introduction, the more we learn, the more questions we have. Mm-hmm. They are adapting to the environment that they now have in North America. Dr. Julie Urban, who has been a part of the project from the very beginning in 2014 with us, she talks to me and she says, Dana, they're doing things I've never seen them do before. So they're adopting and we have to learn and and shift our control and treatment to the new ways they're showing us they're going to respond. And it takes not just one researcher, like I'm here representing researchers, but Dana mentioned Julie Urban. It's a coalition and it's a coalition among universities, uh, USDA agencies, you know, state departments of ag. It's it. There's because we know nothing. And as Julie said, they are behaving differently. So now it's just like a blank slate and every answer does lead to another question. But we try to move as quickly as we we possibly can together as we tackle these questions. And also, you know, where this insect comes from in China, it's very close in climate and range to the Mm mid-Atlantic. So the information that we may have gotten about this insect in the past from previous research just really matches what we know about the climate in the mid-Atlantic. So like Tracy and Dana have been saying, we have an enormous coalition of researchers working on this, not only, you know, the insect biology, but also uh, a lot of modeling, um, trying to use different parts of the puzzle, different types of data to get an estimate, a prediction perhaps, of if it got to this area, could we get a sustaining population? We don't have that really narrowed down yet. I mean, there's a lot of studies out there. I don't know if your listeners do go out and and Google and research studies, but there's several published studies about it. And um, there's just, there's no guarantee or prediction as to where it could establish or not establish. We don't know enough yet. Yes. And it's because there are so many, these different angles and so many questions and stuff. I mean, with the research as well as with just like what we're learning from one state to the next, which is why I was thinking about this one. I was like, I don't want to just have one person just have a researcher, just have somebody from Pennsylvania or from another state that's got it. I want, we need this bigger, broader picture, at least to do an introduction. Then I'm guessing this may not be my last spotted lanternfly episode ever. So then maybe in the future, we might dig into some of these deeper areas a little bit, but I think it's also Nice to bring everybody together and have that conversation because yeah, we don't, we don't even know what we don't know right now. We're just starting to learn that. That is a good point. That is a good point. Mm-hmm. And, and Shannon, it, it is. And that's actually the approach that we take with Spotted Lanternfly. It's a partnership. Mm-hmm. State departments of agriculture work very closely with USDA and with researchers. And we're all sharing insights, information. We take the information that we learn from researchers to try and determine the best way to manage the treatments that we're trying to prevent movement of spotted lanternfly. Researchers and extension agents are helping to provide the outreach that our communities need. 
because without the communities, without research, USDA and states working together, we're going to be lost. We need that great partnership. We need, you know, your podcast is another way. It's another mechanism to share this information and get the word out. That's what we all have to do. We're finding that by educating and letting people know what to look for, when to look for it, and what to do, those are the three key areas. So that if it does come to Kentucky, Shannon, you are certainly, you know who to call already because you know how interested Kentucky is and their concerns. So you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to call. That's great. And we need everybody to be aware so that they have that same connection with their states. Yes, exactly. And so, yeah, I'm going to have links and show notes for people to learn more about this because we want people to learn more. And I mean, this episode will be up forever, pretty much. So as we learn more, I will update more and continue to update those so that we can help get the word out with the best knowledge that we have at any instant in time. But Aaron, do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of the overarching national role and what's going on from the national standpoint with spotted lanternfly? Sure. APHIS and I belong to within APHIS Plant Protection and Quarantine. That's the program. We are working in a very close relationship with the states on this program. This is not going to be a pass that has a silver bullet plan. This is going to be a pass that's going to require, you know, state partners, federal partners, industry, and the public to get a handle and contain and suppress this insect. So at the federal level, our work starts at the ports of entry. So at the ports of entry, spot and lantern flies a quarantine pest. So if spotted lanternfly is found in cargo, international cargo, conveyances, passenger baggage, agricultural officials are going to take action to prevent that insect or those egg masses from coming in. So that's everything from, you know, air cargo, mostly air cargo and maritime cargo we're talking now. We're not talking foot traffic or trucks, Mexico or, or Canada. But so that's what we're working on now. And then we also work really heavily with the states. Each state department of agriculture, we meet regularly with them, the states that are affected. Uh, We also have calls with different industry groups. So the grape industry group, the nursery stock industry group, if you think of, you know, the tree that you might've just bought at Lowe's. So if that's in an SLF area, there could be, you know, egg masses on that. And in each state, there's a state plant health director. That's a federal position, but there's counterparts like Dana is the state plant regulatory official, the SPRO. And those two people work closely together to manage the SLF program. It it is fairly difficult to manage all this many states. If you think about it with other plant pest programs, like maybe a cotton pest or citrus, you're only dealing with a couple of states. This pest is unique in that we're trying to manage all the different pathways that that insect can go on. So we're building partnerships with trucking companies. We're building partnerships with railroads. We're reaching out to our federal partners, such as the Department of Defense. Uh, The Department of Defense has acres and acres and acres of property around this nation that they manage. And um, so we're working with them not only to, to reduce the spread of SLF, but also work with their soldiers and their airmen Because if they move from a military base, you know, they may unsuspectedly take SLF egg masses if they move their RV, if they move their outdoor equipment, their outdoor chairs, you know, their grills that might accidentally bring SLF with them to their new base. And then also the National Park Service, we're working with them. So there's a lot of federal entities. There's a lot of industry we're working with, all trying to coordinate with the goal of suppression and containment here in generally infested area, and then trying to eliminate satellite populations as they pop up. And those satellite populations would be a population that is several counties away, or maybe even a state away from the generally infested area. And I could see how that would be a big job. I mean, just, I mean, our interstate system goes everywhere. And you were talking about earlier, just during the egg laying season, they can get on cars and stuff. And I'm thinking, Okay, somebody stops at a rest area, somebody stops to get a bite to eat on a trip, or just think about all the semi trucks that you see going up and down the interstate all the time, or the trains going back and forth. I mean, I can see how this could be just a huge 
issue to try and contain and manage. And like you said, it can't be just any one group or agency. You need, you need everybody involved at all levels. Yeah. And it really helps us too when the public's involved because uh, you guys can keep a lookout for us. I mean, this pest doesn't have a, a lure. Like if you think of a lepidoptera, if you think of a butterfly or a moth, usually there's like a little pheromone lure you know, that they can use to attract that pest. We don't have that with this pest. This pest is probably more than likely using visual or, or some other cue rather than a specific pheromone. And so a lot of our finds, as you, you might want to call them, are from visual inspection. And that's, and we really rely on that visual survey. So having, you know, your listeners and all of their friends and their friends' friends look for spot and lanternfly and report it to, you know, their agricultural departments, the state agricultural departments is key in helping us fight this fight. And if they do find them, what would be best is if they can snag it, either put it in a plastic bag with some hand sanitizer. If they can't do that, then at least get a photo and a location. Because we really need evidence of this because there are a lot of lookalikes. Um, that people, you know, they, they'll see a box elder bug and they'll think it's a spot or lantern fly. So we really do need to verify, you know, whether a spot or lantern fly has been found or not so that we can take appropriate action when that happens. But snag it or snap a picture of it and get that to your state Department of Agriculture so that the states or the feds can get out there and check it out and uh, see if there's a population present. Yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, when I first started hearing hints of spotted lantern fly, and it was really starting to spread out of like Pennsylvania and some of the states, as far as the information, the outreach was starting to go. I knew pretty moth-like, butterfly-like critter, black and white and red was kind of basic of what I heard. And of course, the only picture I'd seen was the nice one with the wings spread out, which is not the way they look normally. So it did look very butterfly. And I found it was early in the spring. I saw this one butterfly or moth. I don't remember which it was now that I hadn't seen before kind of roughly looked like that. And I took a picture of it real quick before it flew off. I was like, Oh no. Oh no. And I looked up, okay, no, we're, we're fine. But yeah. So it is one of those things you've got to get that proof yes. to be able to go look it up. Yeah. You probably saw a, a tiger moth and those are in the family Arctia day. So there's a lot of moths out there that have like that dull covering, you know, like a wider gray forewing. And then that hind wing is that brilliant orange or that brilliant red. And that's sort of the color scheme that you have for spotter lantern fly. The big difference is, you know, the, the wing texture, you know, on Lepidopter, you're going to have the wing scales and on those moths, you're going to have wing scales and their, their mouth parts are going to be different. But yeah, if you see it like out of the corner of your eye, you might be like, oh no. So getting that evidence is absolutely critical to make sure that we're, we're taking appropriate action and using our resources effectively so that we can get the populations and uh, not spin our wheels on, on perhaps things that aren't spot or lantern fly. And can I add a little bit on just to sort of expand what Aaron was talking about with research? Folks at Rutgers have been leading research to use environmental DNA left behind by spotted lanternflies as a way to potentially, it's kind of like CSI or something, you know, <laughs> um, to detect their presence. So you're basically giving the plant a bath, concentrating the DNA in that bath water and amplifying it to see if you have lanternfly DNA in there. And so that's another mechanism that folks like Aaron and Dana can use to track spread, you know, because as Aaron mentioned, we still don't have a lure for a trap that we want to use. And that's another area of active research, but all of it dovetails with each other, you know, to try to slow the spread. And really when it does spread that we find it as quickly as possible. Yeah. The eDNA, the DNA work is always interesting what you can do with that. But again, I mean, you can't just go out and wash all the trees in the no. trees in the <laughs> world. You've got to have a good idea that, okay, yeah, it was, we think it was here. We weren't able to get the good look. Right. Then you can go get, check it out. But exactly. it does still come back to that, having everybody looking in those a million and a half eyes out there and reporting mm -hmm. if we find it, I mean, mm -hmm. is going to be the best way to find it and yeah. track the spread. Absolutely. And Shannon, it's really important that your listeners know that reporting it to their Department of Agriculture yes. is critical because if you're reported to somebody else, then they have to take the time to find out which state. And so knowing 
as we like to say, know your SPRO. So know who the department head is for each state so that you know where to go if you do find it. That way the action is quick and you can get to work on it right away. The quicker you find it in a state, the better your chances of not spreading it. Yes. Going to your Department of Agriculture, I'd say extension offices. If you're really unsure where it is, go to your local extension office and report it there. I mean, they're going to be in contact with the right people as well. But again, that's another layer that you have to go to. If you know exactly who. Exactly. That's always the best. Yeah. Yes. State Departments of Ag. Promise. We're nice people. We want (laughs) we want to know. Yes. And a, a lot of the states in the program have right there on their banner, if you Google your Department of Agriculture, right there usually is a, a link to how to report spotted and lantern fly. If you're looking for the SPRO, that state regulatory official in your state, there is an organization called the National Plant Board. If they uh, go to the membership of that, that lists the SPRO for each state. In Kentucky, it's um, taken care of by my department. So I'm SPRO. So we have Office of State Entomologist and we have a web- website and all the information on there. All you need to go do, fill out information on our website. We have questionnaire and our people will go out and investigate. We're trying to keep out of Kentucky. So whenever we get calls from neighboring states, even recently in, we had a call from Indiana they found a lantern fly on the border in Switzerland County. So we had to run out there and check the counties in Kentucky side. And we plan to monitor those in the coming spring to make sure they're not going to spread through to Kentucky. I'm really hoping we don't get it for a very long time. So we know more answers. It might have more options. But yeah, four out of seven bordering states. Yeah. <laughs> The, the key is uh, outreach, surveillance, uh, and we have been doing that for Gypsy Moth for almost 20 years now. So Gypsy Moth is in, in all the states neighboring us, but not in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. We just trap them out. and uh, <laughs> uh, So with Lanternfly, we not, may not be able to do that, but with the help from public, we will be able to go and take care of it if we find some places so it won't spread to the state. Yes. That's what I'm hoping for is that we can find it, eliminate it, and keep doing that enough times that it won't really get established. But I think that's what everybody hopes for. So that brings up a question. Like in Pennsylvania, where it's been for a number of years now, is it pretty much everywhere or is it just certain places? It's not everywhere. And even when we expand our quarantines to include new counties, many times it's just a very few municipalities. So it's still very contained in some of the new counties that we add when we have our quarantine expansion. So no, it's not widespread throughout the entire state. And there, like I said, as soon as we can find it, the sooner we get in there to do some treatment, we immediately start then controlling and containing When we have small populations, we're not giving up that hope that we might be able to make an impact on that new population. So we do take action right away, whether it's scraping egg masses in the winter, if that's when we find it, or, you know, making sure that we get permission from property owners to do some treatment, certainly along those high risk pathways, whether it's a highway or rail or an air carrier, we try and get right in there and really hammer the spotted lantern fly as much as we possibly can. And again, raising the community awareness so that they're helping us. They are able to scrape egg masses. If they can do anything on their property to assist in control of spotted lantern fly, we ask that they do so. And people get very creative. Sometimes they do competitions and who can swat the most spotted lantern fly. Who gets the prize for for killing the most? So I applaud the communities for all their efforts uh, as they work with us. But for us to call an area eradicated, we have to have zero fines of spotted lanternfly for three consecutive years. So it's a process to go through. But I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that because we are seeing some reduction in the numbers in areas that we've treated. So we're hopeful. So... Two questions with that. 
if it's not widespread, is the reason why it's not widespread because everybody just gets in and attacks it and there's so much work being done to keep it from spreading or some other reason that we don't know that's keeping it kind of contained to certain areas. Uh, and, and that's where we, again, having our partnership here in Pennsylvania with Penn State University and USDA, we start talking about those moments and what does that possibly mean as we're looking. Pennsylvania also has a permit system for businesses. So if you're in a quarantine county or you're coming in to do business in a quarantine county and think of all the business transactions that happen, that's a lot of people, you have to have a permit. And that permit is designed to raise awareness for business and their employees. So all employees in a business have to be trained on what to look for, what to do, and when to look for spotted lanternfly to prevent it. And that includes inspecting material that you receive at your company. Did somebody ship you spotted lanternfly? Goodness knows you don't want it. But if we have an area in Pennsylvania where we know we don't have spotted lanternfly, we don't want it to ship there either. And so raising that awareness, we have over 1.1 million people throughout the United States that have a permit through Pennsylvania for spotted lanternfly. That's over 23,000 businesses. So that's a huge number of people who have learned what to do for spotted lanternfly. So again, it comes back to that partnership and all of us working together. That is what helps keep these contained. So it's the treatments that we do, whether it is the systemic treatments that last for a year on some of the trees that we use that on, or the contact sprays where we have an influx of large populations. We'll do a, a contact or a broadcast application, scraping egg masses. Each one of those actions impact the population and helps bring it down. When you take into account, you scrape one egg mass, you're essentially killing 35 to 50 new spotted lantern fly. So that's a good thing. You kind of just answered what my next question was going to be was, what can we do? But it sounds like there's the direct killing, scraping off the egg masses, squashing the bugs themselves. And then also there are for larger masses, insecticides, sprays and stuff like that can be done either broadcast spray, it sounds like, or systemics for treating specimen trees. That is correct. And Penn State University has done a great job. They have put together a management guide for homeowners. Uh, there's even some organic options in there. So Shannon, I know that you're going to have that link provided to your listeners. I recommend that they go there. They're going to find a lot of information on that webpage. They'll find lookalikes, Aaron has talked about different insects at different life stages looking like spotted lanternfly. So it'll help them understand better. But that management guide lists different types of pesticides that can be used in different situations. So anything anybody can do is a help to control spotted lanternfly. Yes, that's very helpful that we've got management actions that we can all take. That's nice to know. Yes. Because sometimes you get some sort of new disease or insect or pathogen coming out and there's really not much you can do. I mean, here in Kentucky, we're having to deal now with laurel wilt disease and there isn't anything that can be done or at least not on a landscape level scale. So it's nice to know that at least with spotted lanternfly, we may have options. We do now and we're glad. <laughs> I wish we had had them in 2014. <laughs> yes. And I would like to say that, you know, our research community is amazing. And each year we find out more and more about this insect. And there's a lot of research involved in not only looking at optimizing the treatments that we know that we have, but also exploring to see if there are other treatments available. And there's also a contingent of our research community that is looking into biological control. So, you know, looking to see if there's a native, anything that's native that might have an impact on the population. And then also working with collaborators with the Chinese Academy of Forestry and looking to see if we could maybe 
find a biological option that in its native land that could actually control spider lanternfly here. Now that kind of research takes a long time. And one of the, the defining characteristics of this insect is it's one generation a year. So it's not like we can go into a lab and have back to back to back to back to back research like you might have be able to do with flies. I mean, if you think back to high school and you had those little fruit flies in a jar and you could do, you know, in a semester, you could do a ton of research on, on one colony. It, this insect is only one generation a year. So, you know, hopefully we'll have some biological control options in the future, but that's years away. But we're hopeful. We're hopeful. And go ahead, Tracy. I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, Aaron, that was a perfect setup. So you know, as Aaron was saying, you know, we have candidate biocontrol agents undergoing what we call host specificity screening to ensure if they are specific enough against spotted lanternfly and, and these particular biocontrol agents evolved with spotted lanternfly in its native range, maybe we can deploy that. And the nice thing about biological control is, as you were describing, it's not just a small scale. It can go across ecosystems and agriculture and spread. And so, you know, there are also things like fungi, entomopathogenic fungi that we've seen attacking them, particularly when we have a nice rainy swampy year, you know, so we've had natural epizootic events that have led to identifications. And there are other opportunities too, to still be explored. But like Aaron said, it takes a while when you're dealing with one generation per year, but it is, it's a big, it's a big thrust for the research community because it is something that can reduce populations at a landscape scale. And that's, you know, what you want to do with an invasive. Yes. As frustrating as it can be to take those years and years and years that's going to need for the biological control research, that's something we don't want to rush into. <laughs> right. We need right. to take the time, the time. to really mm -hmm. go through and make sure that they're very specific to that exactly. host because there's been multiple times, especially in the past, where we thought that something was specific and then found out it wasn't. Or yeah, it was specific in the homeland, but when you bring it over here, it decides it like something else that we've got that's native here better. Uh, it's happened before, so we want to make sure that all that time is spent that's needed to be spent and that we don't rush into it because as scary as biological controls can be for those reasons, like you said, in many ways, they're our best bet because they're our landscape level scale mm -hmm. answers. But I think that's exactly it. The lessons learned from the past yes. guide the research today, you know, so mm -hmm. that we are absolutely certain when we make any, you know, when those folks that make those decisions can make them with confidence. So, yeah, yeah. we always make the best decisions we can. Yeah. I mean, the, the mistakes that were made in the past weren't made because well, eh, they didn't care. They were based on the best knowledge that they had. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Then we learn from their mistakes. Right. And in the future, somebody's going to learn from our mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's just the way it works. Shannon, a another note, how I told you that spotted lanternfly is adapting to its environment here. Something that we've kind of been watching because we started receiving reports from people noticing wings of spotted lanternfly lying around on the ground. And we're like, well, what would cause that? It may be that the birds have decided spotted lanternfly is not a bad thing to eat. The red on the wings usually indicates to a predator, like a bird, I'm not tasty. You're not going to like me. But if they're ripping off the wings, we have some people at Penn State who are trying to determine, are the birds ripping the wings off to then eat the body of the bug? So maybe they too are adapting to this new insect that they're finding, which again, it's great if our native species can help with the process. So again, another research project. <laughs> yes. Anybody who's looking for research projects, uh, this is a whole wide open range here of different <laughs> ways to look at things and research. So ready here in Kentucky. I mean, you kind of started mentioning some of this stuff already. What are we doing for the early detection monitoring efforts? Yeah, so we have state entomologist office with five employees. That is our job to go out and educate people on these invasive pests. And do we do a lot of surveillance throughout summer for these pests and disseminate that information 
And if we detect something, we'll go out and eradicate it. And that is how we are keeping a lot of these invasives out of Kentucky. We are fairly successful, actually. So we'll keep doing that. And if we've got enough people looking for it Mm -hmm. and we catch it early, that's our best chance of keeping it out. I mean, like you said, going out there and eradicating it as soon as we find it. Absolutely. And I'm assuming other states are doing pretty much the same thing that don't have it yet. They are, Shannon. States are highly involved. I know North Carolina, one of your neighboring states, is also doing quite a bit there as far as monitoring and following up on all possible reports. And in fact, they just have received two canine detectors to go and look in areas. Pennsylvania has one and now North Carolina has two. So we're using all means possible to try and sniff spotted lanternfly out whenever they are in an area. And then I would assume if it gets established in a new state, then there's going to be whole new protocols put into place to kind of keep it from spreading outside of that area where it's established at. Yeah, and the USDA works closely, not only with the program states, the ones that have populations in it, but we're in constant contact with other states because obviously everyone is worried, especially, you know, nursery stock and and certain in grape industry and the hops industry. A A lot of these industries are very concerned. So we have federal level outreach. So if you go to the Hungry Pest website, we do have outreach materials and a pest alert about spotted lanternfly. If it's found in a new state, we work and collaborate with that state's Department of Agriculture. We definitely want to get out there and survey and try to figure out, you know, how big the population is. And first of all, we want to figure out, is this, is this a population or not? You know, oftentimes it'll just be maybe a hitchhiking insect or something. So of course, we're going to go back routinely to that area and look to see if there's a population, but there may not be a an established reproducing population there. So we want to sort of get the correct information out so that we can help the state start to survey and look for so that they can take appropriate action and we can uh, assist and support that. Yes. And that's really helpful. And then we've been talking about the research throughout, which is great because the research is really informing what steps we take. And we've been kind of in a triage mode, I would say, in many respects with the, oh crap, what do we do? How does it spreading it? How do we stop it? Learning those initial things that you have to know before you can do anything else. But it also seems like we're getting, not that we're out of triage stage, but that we're also getting to the point where we can breathe enough to look a little bit further and start to look at the, okay, now what? And look at some of those deeper questions as well. But it's still very much both are informing each other. So Tracy, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other research that either you and your lab are doing or that you know some of your colleagues are doing that would be really important for us to know about? Sure. And, you know, I think it's almost a continuum from triaging to deeper questions because, Mm -hmm. you know, when when you're dealing with an invasive, we literally are starting from the beginning. So just understanding more, in this case, about spotted lanternflies, basic biology, its ecology and its behavior. For example, colleagues at U.S. Forest Service and Penn State have done a lot of work just to understand at what temperatures, how long does it take to develop through each life stage? And that is what tells us then, you know, oh, we only have a single generation per year and the eggs seem to have to have some kind of chilling period possibly. But again, that's the basics. But then, you know, you start to say, well, okay, so that nymph that is a nymph for 10 days, does it stay on a single host plant or does it move? And so, for example, in my group, we're starting to do gut content analysis where we take insects, we collect them in the field to understand what plants they're feeding on, you know, really detecting the plant DNA that's left behind. Because as Dana mentioned, that these guys as nymphs are like kids, they taste everything, but when they become adults, they get to be a little bit finicky. So those kind of techniques can help you understand how their host preference changes over their life history. There's a lot of work going on in terms of trying to understand dispersal behavior and the cues that they use. 
and then how we could potentially exploit these as a mechanism for monitoring or management. So, you know, it just kind of all each question leads to another question. And a lot of times it's really basic information that we have to learn, but ultimately it becomes an application in the entire project and program. You know, we were talking earlier about monitoring this insect. And so we've spent a lot of time doing what Aaron was describing, starting to look for odors this insect might be attracted to so we can develop a lure for traps. And last year we had some success with finding, we, we've basically been manipulating tree of heaven to see if we can make a hot tree because what we see in nature are, you know, certain trees that they're always aggregating on and feeding on. And so We've been doing some things with some of our breeders at my unit, and we have been able to make these so-called hot trees where in the field, we see this constant attraction to them relative to unmanipulated plants. So if we can figure out what is making it hot, maybe we can make a hot lure. And that's kind of like the kind of things that we do in our lab group. But, um, you know, it, I mean, honestly, we started just doing things like when I first interacted with this insect, like how far can they jump and how far will they jump? And they can jump several meters or more, even as a very small nymph. And so they can disperse over some distance as a, a even a nymph. And then as adults trying to understand how far they can fly is another question. But yeah, like I said earlier, it really is a coalition. This is just one small piece. There are people working in specific cropping systems, whether it's grapes or ornamentals or forestry, people working on the biological control agents, whether it's the predators or parasitoids, native or the classical biocontrol, people working on physiology of the insect, the symbionts they contain in their guts and what does it do for them? And, and then how you can exploit some of these things after you learn all about them. It's, it's, it's always, it's amazing how much we learn really quickly when we have these kind of coalitions, but, but it's never fast enough. Yeah. Well, with anything, you're always learning. I mean, yeah. think about how much we don't know about common native yeah, things. Absolutely. I mean, and this is something that's been in the U.S. for yeah. less than 10 years now. Exactly. I've spent the better part of the last decade or so studying brown marmorated stink bug and other invasive. And we still learn new things about that bug too. <laughs> every, every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Over the past couple of years, we've really seen them explode around my house. I was like, oh, I hate these things. <laughs> But that, that's a whole different topic. In that's another topic. We, yeah. Yes. Well, this has been really, really educational. And I've learned a lot. And I'm hoping my listeners have as well. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add that you think our listeners should know about before we wrap up? For the research, stopslf.org is the research website that folks can learn about the latest and greatest in terms of the research projects that are ongoing with Spotted Lanternfly. That'll be very good to know. I'll definitely have that one and the show links because, well, I want to know it too. Um, <laughs> as a scientist myself, I mean, I'm always digging into the research and wanting to know, but I also know many of our listeners are interested in it as well, whether they are scientists or just want to know and keep up with the latest research. Anybody else want to add anything in at the end here? I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be able to share our stories. We really need to get the message out because the more people know, the more empowered they become to take action. And with this particular insect, it is important. The sooner you see it, you have to report it so that some action can be taken. So please, please help us as we are, are moving forward even if you're living in a state where you know that they have it, it may be a new area that they were not aware of. So don't hesitate to let the state know. Yes. And I really appreciate all of you all taking the time to have this conversation and to help us get the word out and, and all the work that you guys have been doing, both to control and for the education and outreach, because like we've said so many times during this conversation, it really is a team effort and a collaboration. It takes everybody in this instance to really be able to manage this invasive species at all. But yeah, thanks a lot. And 
I will definitely, like I said before, I will have links in the show notes to a variety of different resources that people can go to, to learn more about this. And thanks again, everyone for talking with us today. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, have a great Thank you so much, Shannon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I really appreciate each of our guests taking the time to talk with us today. Being able to sit down and talk with everyone at once helped me better understand the spotted lantern fly, what we know about it, what we're still learning, what some of the threats are that it poses, and some of what we're doing to try and control it. I hope you found this conversation as informative and helpful as I did. One of the points that all of our guests brought up, and which I think can't be repeated enough, is that this really is a team effort, and that each of us has a role to play. If we're in an area that already has spotted lanternflies, then we need to be diligent and do everything that we can to avoid accidentally moving it to someplace new. If we're in an area where it hasn't established yet, then we need to pay attention. And if we think we've found it, then we need to document it and report it so that we have the best chance of eliminating it before it has that chance to establish a new population. And for me, this just gives me one more reason to battle the tree of heaven or Atlantis on my property. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know about my email list. Every week, I send a short email with links to the most recent Backyard Ecology blog article and podcast episode, as well as any other news of interest. It's the best way to make sure that you never miss anything in the Backyard Ecology world. If you haven't signed up, then I encourage you to do so at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.